Have you ever heard the term atrial fibrillation and wonder where it came from? Well, today we're going to be talking about just that. We're going to be covering atrial rhythms when it comes to ECG identification. Let's get started. So to begin, there are common rules that we see whenever we're identifying atrial rhythms. Number one, it's going to originate within the atria. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's originating from the SA node. So that's very important to know when we're talking about these kinds of rhythms. What's also key is that our QRS complex is going to be narrow and normal. Anytime we have a rhythm that's coming at the junction or above the junction, the QRS complex should be narrow and normal. And lastly, with atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, anytime we see rates greater than 100 beats per minute, that means we're going to call it uncontrolled. There's no such thing as atrial fibrillation tachycardia or atrial flutter tachycardia. No, we actually call it uncontrolled. So we're going to talk about the differences between controlled and uncontrolled controlled when it comes to AFib and a flutter. So let's begin with our most commonly seen atrial rhythm known as atrial fibrillation. It's also often referred to as atrial arrhythmia, and it is prevalent condition among many patients, especially the elderly cardiac patients that you may see. So this rhythm is characterized by our atria. These are the upper chambers of our heart. And what's happening up here is we're having this quivering or fibrillating that's happening rather than actually having a full normal deep polarization. This quivering is going to lead to high rates of atrial activity close to almost 800 times per minute, a rate that would be unsustainable for the ventricles to match. So when we're looking at P waves and atrial fibrillation, the atria do not have discrete pacemaker activities, but instead exhibit continuous chaotic electrical activity. This often results in what we call fibrillatory waves or sometimes a flat line where traditional P waves are absent. And because of this, there will be no P to QRS ratio. And when it comes to our PR interval, we're also going to see it be non-measurable because we don't have distinctive P waves. The good news in this is that the QRS complex is going to remain completely normal and narrow, being less than 0.12 seconds. This rhythm is also characterized by the fact that it's going to be irregular. So in normal conditions, the sinoatrial node, which is up here at the top of our heart, generates regular electrical impulses that ensure synchronized heartbeats. However, in atrial fibrillation, multiple erratic re-entry circuits within the atria fire simultaneously, overwhelming the heart's natural pacemaking capabilities. As these numerous impulses bombard our atrial ventricular node, it struggles to filter them consistently, allowing only some to pass through the ventricles at irregular intervals. This results in the ventricles responding unpredictably, manifesting as an irregularly irregular rhythm that is the hallmark sign of atrial fibrillation. So what are some of the causes when it comes to AFib? Well, it could be some numerous kinds of heart conditions. We have chronic conditions such as hypertension, heart valve disease, coronary artery disease, congenital heart defects, as well as heart failure. Other medical conditions can include thyroid imbalances, especially hyperthyroidism, sleep apnea, and other chronic conditions like diabetes and lung disease. Age is also another big factor. The risk increases for atrial fibrillation as we age. Lifestyle factors also plays a key role when it comes to this rhythm. Excessive alcohol intake, smoking, obesity, lack of physical exercise, and even those with post-surgical complications like we see with heart surgery. When it comes to signs and symptoms, they mirror a lot of other arrhythmias. You're going to see palpitations, fatigue and weakness, dizziness and lightheadedness. You can even see shortness of breath, particularly when it comes to physical activity or even at rest in some severe cases. When it comes to chest pain, this can occur essentially whenever we're seeing high heart rates. So the higher the heart rate, the more likely the patient may experience chest pain. And then lastly, we have confusion. So confusion really are transient episodes related to that decreased cerebral perfusion that takes place with this heart rhythm. What's important to note is that patients may be asymptomatic a majority of the time. With atrial fibrillation, it's only really discovered through physical examinations or ECGs conducted for many various reasons. So how are we going to treat this condition? Treatment strategies for atrial fibrillation is going to focus on rate control, 
rhythm control, and stroke prevention. So when we talk about rate control, we may see medications being given like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers may also be used to control the heart rate. With rhythm control, medications to restore that normal heart rhythm, also known as antiarrhythmics, or procedures like electrical cardioversions may take place. Cardioversions is when we shock the heart back into its normal rhythm. So with stroke prevention, due to that high risk of blood being clotted up in those atria, you're going to see patients on anticoagulants, also known as blood thinners, like warfarin or newer agents that may be prescribed. If all else fails, we could see catheter ablation, which is a procedure that destroys the area of the heart tissue that is causing the irregular signals. Next up, we have atrial flutter, which is a specific type of tachycardia known as re-entry tachycardia, characterized by the rapid circulation of electrical impulses within our atria. Typically, the atrial rate when it comes to flutter can range anywhere between 250 to 350 times per minute, which is exceptionally fast and unsustainable for normal life functions. However, not all of these impulses are going to be transmitted to the ventricles. The ventricles usually Usually conduct at a slower rate due to that atrial ventricular node's capacity to filter out many of those atrial impulses. Due to the AV node's gatekeeping, the rhythm can be regular or irregular depending on when the electricity can get through to the ventricles. The atrial rhythm in flutter is generally regular, and instead of the typical P waves that you would see on regular rhythms, there's actually going to be this distinct sawtooth pattern that you're going to see before the QRS complex. These are known as F waves. The atrial ventricular conduction ratio can vary. Most commonly, you might see a two to one ratio, meaning that we have two atrial flutter waves occurring before each QRS complex, effectively having our ventricular response rate compared to that of our atrial rate. So for instance, if our atrial rate is 300 beats per minute in a two to one flutter ratio, the resulting ventricular rate would be approximately 150 beats per minute. What's also important to note is as we discussed with atrial fibrillation, we're also going to see that same variation when it comes to our heart rate with atrial flutter. Anytime we have a heart rate less than 100, we call that a controlled heart rate. And anytime we see heart rates greater than 100, we call that uncontrolled. And then lastly, the signs, symptoms, and causes, as well as treatment, are going to mimic what we see with atrial fibrillation. So let's discuss our last atrial rhythm known as narrow complex supraventricular tachycardia, which is characterized by a rapid heart rate that originates from above the ventricles, hence the name supraventricular. It's characterized by a heart rate typically exceeding 150 beats per minute with a narrow QRS complex, usually less than 0.12 seconds. What's interesting about this rhythm is that it involves the atria and the connections in the atrial ventricular node, and it does not initially involve the ventricles. During SVT, the electrical signals in the heart's upper chambers misfire, causing a significantly faster heartbeat due to this enormous amount of signals that are getting through to the ventricles. So when it comes to the rhythm, the rhythm is going to be regular even though it's abnormally fast. Our heart rate is going to be greater than 150 beats per minute. You can even see it almost upwards of 250 beats per minute. When it comes to our P waves, that ventricular rate is going to be too fast for us to even see our P waves taking place. Know that they are taking place, they're just being hidden inside of our ECG. And because we don't have P waves, we're not going to have a measurable PR interval. And like we discussed before, for that QRS complex is going to be narrow and normal. It's going to be less than 0.12 seconds. Remember, anytime we have a rhythm that is originating either at the junction, which is right here in between our atria and our ventricles, or above, we're going to see a QRS complex that is narrow and normal. So what are some of the causes that we're going to see behind SVT? Well, we could see structural heart disease. Anytime we have some kind of underlying heart condition, it can ultimately predispose us to having SVT. You can also see electrolyte imbalances, particularly abnormalities when it comes to potassium and magnesium levels. Excessive caffeine and alcohol intake can actually exacerbate or trigger these episodes. The same thing goes when it comes to stress. Emotional and physical stress can initiate SVT. 
And then lastly, some individuals just have a genetic predisposition when it comes to SVT. There's a lot of different genetic factors that can ultimately lead to the development of SVT. Signs and symptoms are pretty much going to remain the same like we see with all heart rhythms. The only difference is that we could see syncope and we could see anxiety. So in case you didn't know, syncope is episodes of fainting or near fainting that can occur due to prolonged SVT. And as you can imagine, feeling that beating and that rhythm inside your chest that's just you can't control, that could lead to some tremendous anxiety. So how are we going to treat this kind of condition? Well, when it comes to the treatment of SVT, we aim to slow the heart rate, restore the normal rhythm, and address the underlying cause. One of the treatment options we can see is vagal maneuvers. We do this through Valsalva maneuver, which is an attempt to breathe out forcefully when you have your nostrils and your mouth closed. This can sometimes stop the episode by stimulating that vagus nerve, which helps control the heart rate. We may also see medications taking place like antiarrhythmic drugs or even beta blockers to help control the heart rate and even prevent future episodes from taking place. Electrical cardioversions are great, especially in cases of emergencies. What happens is, is there's a controlled shock that's provided to the heart, which ultimately can help reset it into its normal rhythm. And then lastly, as we discussed before, we may see a catheter ablation take place, which is often a permanent solution where a pathway that's causing that SVT from taking place is destroyed by radio frequency energy. So let's do some practice. So we begin by identifying our rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? So if I was to measure out my R to R complexes, you're going to see that they don't fall in the same place every single time. Some are longer, some are shorter. So we can absolutely identify this as an irregular rhythm. And because it's irregular, we're just going to count our QRS complexes. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we have a total of 12, meaning that we have a heart rate of 120 beats per minute. Next up, do we have any identical P waves? As you can see here, we just kind of have these fibrillatory lines. So absolutely, we do not have any P waves that we are able to measure. And because we don't have any P waves that we can measure, that means we also don't have a PR interval. Next, taking a look at our QRS complexes, we can see that these QRS complexes are very, very narrow. So we can absolutely say with certainty that these QRS complexes are going to be less than 0.12 seconds. And do we have any abnormal beats? We absolutely do not. So based on everything that we see up here, being that we have an irregular rhythm, we have no P waves, no PR interval, and we have a narrow QRS complex, we can say with certainty that this is called atrial fibrillation. The big key here that I want you to take away is that you always have to say whether it's controlled or uncontrolled. So in this case, because we have a heart rate that's 120 beats per minute, we can absolutely call this rhythm an uncontrolled atrial fibrillation. So let's take a look at our next practice. So with our rhythm, is it regular or irregular? If I was to march these out, you're gonna see that they're gonna kind of fall in the exact same place every single time. So we can absolutely call this rhythm regular. When it comes to my heart rate, I'm gonna go ahead and count that out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have approximately 70 beats per minute. Next up, we're taking a look at our P waves. As you can see here, we actually have a couple of extra P waves that we didn't originally encounter right before our, in our other rhythm. So in this case, we're gonna have a two to one P wave, and these are also gonna be known as F waves. Because of the presence of F waves, we're not going to have a measurable PRI interval. So we can go ahead and skip over that. And if we take a look at our QRS complexes, these look very narrow, they look very normal. So we can absolutely say with certainty that these are less than 0.12 seconds. And then are there any abnormal beats? Based on what I'm seeing here, there are no abnormal beats. So what kind of rhythm do we have? You are absolutely correct. The correct rhythm is atrial flutter. But again, it's very important that we call it either controlled or uncontrolled. Being that we have a heart rate of 70 beats per minute, that means it's less than 100 beats per minute, we can call this controlled atrial flutter. So let's take a look at our last practice question. So we start by identifying our rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? Based on what I'm seeing, if I was to measure this out, the QRS complex always falls in the same place. So we can call this rhythm regular. 
Next up, we count how many QRS complex we have. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. So we have approximately 160 beats per minute. So do we see any P waves? Well, what's happening here is that that ventricular rate is happening at such a fast rate that we're not going to be able to see distinguishable P waves when it comes to this rhythm. So no, we do not have any P waves. And because we don't have P waves, we're also not going to be able to measure our PR interval. So is our QRS complex narrow and normal or big, wide, and ugly? In this case, it's very, very narrow, right? We're able to see that it's gonna be less than 0.12 seconds. And do we have any abnormal beats? Absolutely not. I don't see any premature beats. I don't see anything that would be abnormal. So what kind of rhythm do we have here? You are absolutely correct. The correct rhythm is a narrow complex supraventricular tachycardia. I hope that this video was helpful in understanding how to identify atrial rhythms. If you have any additional questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechungstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources in order to help you ace these ECG rhythms. And as always, I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye!